All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Business Bros. I'm a solo bro today, and on today's show, we got Mr. Paul Schumann. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Paul. Paul has a book, Secret Myths and Realities of Achieving Financial Independence. He's been in business for 46 years. He has uh, with with uh, Wise Wealth Choices, and we're going to get to know Paul here Uh I'm always interested to find out what people have done in their lives when, you know, I I talk to a lot of uh, young kids. I teach high school at East Lake High, Paul, and uh, I teach a course called Financial Algebra. So I'm trying to teach 17-year-olds the importance of having a little financial intelligence about making good choices. Uh, And everybody I talk to always says, man, I wish I had that course in high school. And then I always remind them, yeah, but they're 17. They haven't quite realized the importance of the information that I'm giving them. You've been in business for 46 years. You've yeah. seen kids grow up to become young men, to become you know, husbands and fathers and, and you know, go through the whole gamut of you know, the accumulation phase into retirement and all that stuff. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, let's start off with you know, who you are, how you decided to get into this self-employed thing. And, uh, and, you know, and tell me some stories about yourself. Well, <clears throat> I guess an equal starting place would be college. I, I graduated in 1971 with a bachelor's science degree in chemistry. Chemistry. Now, yeah, chemistry. People say chemistry. How did you get from chemistry into everything else you've done in life? And <clears throat> it, it had to do with my dad being an electronic engineer for the U.S. government and what he was involved in with the government, which were, well, let's just say that he was one of the first people that helped develop the very first computer in existence. He helped build the first solar cell in existence. And he had, he had an IQ that was at least equal to Einstein or better. Wow. He was an amazing individual. So he, he set the bar low for you then. <laughs> So I was always trying to figure out how I could be kind of like him in a way. We, we both, I had a fairly good math background. And, but I realized after I got into college, and even though I graduated with a degree in chemistry, that really wasn't where my heart was. My heart was in business. And I didn't have, back in the 60s and 70s, they didn't have any real coaches there in college to to get you through some of the humps to figure out what you're really the best at. I know when I graduated from high school, um, they said my accolades, you might say, were in accounting and and number crunching and stuff like that, but I'm going too dry. Anyway, but what happened was in my last year of college, I had met a gentleman who was also graduating and he said, hey, Um, I met this real estate broker up in North Long Beach and he said, he's got a deal for us. Would you like to go partner with me? I said, well, at that moment in time in my life, all I didn't have any money, you know, it's just a college grad. But what was interesting, back then, college was virtually free. I went to Cerritos College, a two-year college, and that was like all you paid for was your books. And I think $10 a semester or something. Then I graduated after that, and I went to Cal State Long Beach, which was a four-year university. And I think the two years I was there, I think between the books, the tuition, and everything, it might have been seven or eight hundred dollars. The two years total cost, you know. And nowadays, it was it would just be a ridiculous number. Add a couple zeros. Yeah, easy. But when I got out of college, I met this guy and he said, let's go into real estate. And I said, okay, I don't know the first thing about it, except that my oldest brother at the time was a mega multimillionaire in real estate. He had like 4,000 houses, five shopping centers, office buildings, and was doing okay in life. And he was teaching me a little bit, but not all that much. And... So I went off and I I joined forces with another guy in in college there. And the first thing we did in 1972, we bought a 16 unit apartment building for no money down in North Long Beach. And at close of escrow, I put $3,000 in my pocket. No money. Okay, so so 
I was, you know, I, I always tell my story that I bought my first home when I was 20. You bought a 16 unit apartment building before you even had like a career going really. So to, you know, elaborate a little bit on that. How, how does that even pop in your head? Like this is the thing I should do. Well, it wasn't, it was just this buddy that I met there. He said, Hey, you want to do this? So we got involved and we had to rehab the, the units a little bit before we closed escrow. So I moved into one of them. We started painting and recarpeting and fixing things up. So the place would look better. And then we finally got a lender that would lend all the money to us. And the seller took a second, a hundred percent and the broker split commissions with us. So we made money at close of escrow. We didn't care. Uh, but the creativity and the elbow grease is what really helped you get into this deal. Exactly. And the same broker said, Hey, you want to continue on in playing in real estate? <clears throat> There's some raw land right across the street from the Huntington Harbor Yacht Club. It's called Sunset Heights. It's one block away. And it used to be oil fields. And in 1945, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica used to give away 25 by 49 pieces of land. You got the deed to it if you bought a set of encyclopedias. Back then, I mean, they were buying them in, in the 1940s. It cost them next to nothing. However, the oil fields, there was only like one oil well out there and there was easements running everywhere, but nobody used the land and nobody could build on it because of all these easements. So my partner said, if we put four of these lots together, we'd have enough for a fourplex. And as long as we stay out of the easements, we could do that. So we started assembling land. And what they realized is that we didn't have money to build, so we flipped the land builders and developers. And I think in six months, we made like $22,000 just flipping raw land. Remember, this is in 1973. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money back then. Then my partner said, hey, this is really dumb. Look at those guys. They're building fourplexes and triplexes, and we're not doing anything. Why not? So he got a hold of a contractor, architect contractor named William Buck. We sat down with him and started designing fourplexes, and we ended up building 14 apartment buildings and a 42,000 square foot office building before my partner decided that he wanted to keep all the money and basically wipe out the corporation. <laughs> it was, um, but by then, you, by then you already dipped your feet into real estate. You've become a little bit of an entrepreneur. There was no way you were going back to corporate America or finding a job. Yeah, well, see, when I graduated with my degree in chemistry, Shell Oil Company came to us and said, we'd like to offer all of you a job. And I said, well, how much does the job pay? And he says, $8,000 a year in research. I'm going, one, I don't think I'd be very well in research. And two, $8,000 a year just doesn't do it for me. No, well, you went off and did a deal, flipped it for twenty-two. I mean... Well, yeah, we split it amongst us, but still, we were doing okay. And then we started building apartment buildings, and we understood things that can go wrong. You know, we were in the Sunset Heights area, but we were also in the Coastal Commission. And what's interesting is we got into it just as the Coastal Commission started. So they didn't know all the rules and regulations yet. They were just figuring it out. So I was the one designated by our company and several other builders in the area to go and meet with the uh, Lieutenant Carpenter and the entire Coastal Commission and work out so we could build these fourplexes. I ended up getting us all permits. Everybody had permits except for one. That was the city of Huntington Beach. They didn't have the permits to put in the streets, the sewers, the, the gutters, the lights, the electricity, and all the rest of it. So we ended up building 14 apartment buildings, couldn't close any of them. <laughs> didn't have any streets in front. <laughs> Fortunately, the banks were working with us because they realized that we didn't have the problem, the city did. But we, we ended up eventually closing all the escrows, everybody did fine, we made a little money, but not what we should have. And we made a bunch of money on the office building. And that sort of kick-started me <clears throat> into it. And then I went off on my own, started my own real estate company. I got my actual broker's license in 1979, 1980. I was one of the very first ones that got it just as they 
started to figure out that they should keep records. Because when I asked them, I says, here's my real estate license. Um, when did I actually get my license? He goes, um, our records don't go back that far. <laughs> but we, we guesstimate it was right about 1980, based on the number that was on mine. Because it was a very, very low number compared to the numbers they are today. And I started to work with other builders and developers and architects who all knew about me putting these things together, helping for our company. They didn't like my partner, but they liked me. I had an architect that opened up his office, built me my own office inside there, and just told me to go out and put deals together for him. So I did. That was fun. Um, and that was kind of like got me kickstarted in the whole real estate industry. And back then, <clears throat> the law was in California, it was real simple. If you had a licensed real estate broker, you could also do mortgage loans under your license. And it didn't it a change. Separation yet? 2010 or something. Hmm. So that all shifted and changed. And now you need an NMLS license. But the real estate broker, so I was also got in, I think, 1985. I picked up my life insurance license, my securities license. And I was able to sit down with a homeowner. I could list their house, sell their house, mortgage their house, and put them into an investments and then put a a life insurance policy wrap around so if the owner died, the house would be paid off. So I had everything. But I found it wasn't really my calling for all the rest of those things. So I let my life insurance and securities kind of like go by the wayside. And I stayed in mortgage lending and real estate for pretty much forever. Well, I noticed on your website that you, you still, your company still offers a branch of on the life insurance side. So um, you have somebody else handling that, but it's still part of your, your repertoire. Well, it is, but that's going to kind of change because my wife works for Mass Mutual mm -hmm. Life Insurance and she does disability, life insurance, long-term care. And she, she has a team around her that's like the top number one agents and attorneys in Mass Mutual right here in La Jolla, California. So we're trying to put together some deals, you know, for them. So they can do it, but I let my license expire again. I got it again. I don't know why I got it again. But I, <laughs> I learned all the laws, all the rules, all the, you know, got the education. So I could literally speak with people about what was happening in the life insurance industry without quoting them anything that would make my license, you know, having a license or not having a license cause an issue. And then if they had an interest, I would just turn them over to my wife and say, here, She'll take it from here with the top attorneys and people and you'll be okay. And then she runs that part of it. But I don't. Well, okay. So you've been in, in this, in, in real estate for 46 years, you've seen some up markets and down markets. You've been through interest rates at like 12, 14, 15%. Um, you've been, you've seen I, them. My house in 1978 that I bought in La Habra Heights in a state overlooking the ocean in the world was at 18% interest. See, and, and, you know, right now we're, we're hearing, you know, interest rates are going to stay low. We're going to see maybe an uptick. We're complaining about a 5% interest rate. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that people speculate on. You've seen the ups and downs of changes, and yet you're still in the industry. What kind of advice would you give to agents that are newer, that are just getting started <clears throat> to help them make a career out of this rather than just a trial run? This is my personal opinion. We're going to see a nasty recession. And when I would have expected it by now, but because the feds basically dropped to 0% interest, it, it threw everything the haywire. But <clears throat> when you actually look into the investment world, like I look into, because I, I look at stock markets, I look at mortgage markets, I look at the housing market, all that. And for a number of years, I stepped out of that and I'm stepping back into the other part. Again, that's in debt settlement, debt relief. Because people got into a lot of trouble. And right now, we're looking at the U.S. economy sitting at about $1.4 trillion in credit card debt. Interest rates on credit cards are the highest they've literally ever been. Back in 2006, 7, 8, typically interest rates were about 6 7% starting rate right now even for somebody with an 800 fico score is about 15 to 16 percent and it goes up to about 30 something 
I know because my wife had an 840 FICA score when she applied for one of her credit cards to get these rewards and stuff. Came back at, I think, 21% interest. This is with an 840 FICO score. Zero derogatories, perfect rating on everything. That's, that's, see, the banks are getting back at everybody because they lost money in the real estate. At least some of them made fortunes in the real estate, but a lot of them lost some money. So they're going, how do we get it back from the public? There's nothing in savings account, those things. The only thing we can get them on is credit cards. Mm -hmm. We can get them for late fees, penalty fees, and huge interest rates. And guess what? We'll tease them with a 0% interest rate in the end of 12 months they'll be looking at 19 to 23% interest from there on. So it's a trap they set and people fall for the trap. They know that. Now, I know, cause I have been on both sides of the, of the financial game, you might say. I was in 2006, seven, I had a financial statement of somewhere around six and a half million dollars. I was doing fine. I didn't have any issues or problems. I had houses, companies, corporations, I had everything running until the market crashed. It took me down six and a half million dollars. Ouch. Then I understood what it was like being poor. But I also understood how to build credit. Because when I went down, and very few people believe this, I had $600,000 in credit card debt. Ooh. You had a mortgage and credit card debt. Yeah. And a mortgage and credit card debt. That's right. But and I like $5 million of equity in my other property. So I wasn't worried until the equities disappeared and I was facing with massive debt on houses. So they all went upside down. Everything went upside down. And I was paying $30,000 a month in fees and stuff until it all went away. And I just, had a, I had a walk from it. But since that time in 2009, when I filed and my bankruptcy has gone, I learned how to rebuild. And this is something that takes time. And unless you've got an incredible income behind you, it's going to take many years for you to rebuild that really trust in the industry. But like right now, I've got maybe, I don't know, 11, 12 credit cards with about $160,000 worth of credit lines of I don't use them. But what's interesting in the last nine years, this is how much interest I've paid. And I had balances of 30, 40, 50,000 on my cards. I've never paid a dime in interest in nine years. And I use them all the time. It's a very interesting game on how to learn how to use 0% interest rate cards, balance transfer issues and things to work money up and back so you never pay interest on your cards. Hmm. I just don't think it's a good thing to do. Oh, nobody wants to pay the bank. (laughs) I teach people some games, depending upon where they're at in life and what their cash flow is and what they want to do, if they own a house or cars or whatever. I teach them how to play a game a little bit to build up and people say, well, you know, why do I need so much credit? Because if you can get it at 0% interest, and you can invest that in a market or into gold and silver or into something for a year, sell it off and pay the card off before it ever goes to any interest rates. You did what the banks are doing in reverse. You are now making money on bank money instead of them making money on your money. Hmm. And now right now there's a couple of banks that are in kind of nasty trouble with the feds. Chase Bank just got a bad rating for one of the first times out there. So what they did, and thanks to President Trump, he now allowed the banks to go in and steal all the depositors' money to buy their stocks back, therefore changing the ratio of debt to the stockholders rating and brought them out of what they call bad rating for the feds. Capital One is also in trouble too. Those two came up many times on the internet as as banks in trouble. Deutsche Bank is in serious trouble. Unfortunately, if Deutsche Bank goes down, half the world will go down. Deutsche Bank literally transacts quadrillions of dollars throughout the entire world. 
and right now they're in trouble. Too many derivatives. You know, the federal government came back <clears throat> in 2009 and after the crash said, it's against the law, the bank to put out derivatives on their mortgage loans, because <clears throat> that was one of the key issues that caused the crash, because nobody could figure out these derivatives. And when the banking industry started to slip and the houses went under, all these derivatives became worthless, primarily because each derivative was one one thousandth of a thousand different mortgages. <clears throat> That's why they call it a derivative, because they wanted to spread <clears throat> the, the liability, you might say. Yeah, the risk. The risk. Well, unfortunately, when it went down, legally, nobody could foreclose on the houses because you needed the original note intact to foreclose. And a lot of these banks, and literally, there's probably tens of thousands of houses sitting in the bank's warehouses. They can't sell because they have no deed for them. They took them illegally. And that's when back, way back when, back when, the senators were saying, show us the deed, show us the note, show us something that says you own it. They couldn't. They took them anyway. <clears throat> A lot of lawsuits, but they ended up, people didn't come back to their houses because they thought the bank legitimately owned them. They didn't. So how do we prepare for an impending recession, whether it's a big one or a short one or whatever ends up happening? You've seen them come and go. How do we prepare for something like that? <clears throat> you know, that's kind of an, an individual situation. But the way I look at things is I look at my overall asset base. Anything that's leveraged too much, I will lose. So the idea is to remove your leverage. Mm -hmm. If you had a house that only had 50% loan to value and we had a recession and it went down 30, 40% in value, you'd still be okay. You'd still have some equity and your mortgage costs would be low enough that if you rented it out, you could ride through it. And that's what I tell people. I says, if you've got high mortgages and you only have a small amount of equity in today's market, sell. Put the cash, whatever you have. And you have to be careful about banks because banks can go under too and take your money. And because of Trump, he changed the law. The FDIC no longer has to bail you out. The bank can take the money out of the depositors' accounts and 401ks they have, and they can keep it. And you can't get it back. True, because, that's scary. You know, it, it's, it's one of those nasty, nasty things that are out there in regulations that people don't know. We're, we keep get, I keep getting emails warning people saying, the bank can do this. They can take your money, just like Chase did, you know, and they, they spent it on buying stock back. It's, so I would tell anybody, if they are highly leveraged in real estate, start selling off their portfolio. Put it into cash if you have a high mortgage on your house and you don't want to lose it. <clears throat> Make sure that you refinance to the lowest rate and then start paying that mortgage down. But pay it down before you refinance so that way you don't have to pay interest or points on the money you're borrowing because you're paying it down anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's just say you had a, a $500,000 house, you owed $400,000 on it, but you had $150,000 in the bank and you really love that house. I mean, you, that's where you want to be. I'd take about a hundred grand, pay down the mortgage, refinance it to the lowest interest rate possible, keep the other $50,000 in various and sundry liquid things. The reason I say liquid things is because if the market does take this downturn and you see houses seriously drop in price like it did around 2010, you don't want to hop in. That's when all the rich people went in and bought. So you've got to have money and leverage. And if you're not over mortgaged on your house, lenders will like that. Well, let me ask you about that because there's a lot of people who are banking on on a recession coming. They're waiting for, you know, prices to drop so I can come in and, and start to flip again and, and start to buy up as many properties as I possibly can. And, but they're thinking about it with equity in their home. Currently, they think I have a line of credit right now, for example, and you know, I'm ready to go when something happens. But what, what I keep trying to emphasize to them is if it's a line of credit, the bank can easily close it. If you don't have it, you know, active, if you're not using it, they can just shut it down or drop the amount that you're allowed to borrow or change the rates or change the terms, whatever it's going to be. So you don't, you know, that line of credit, credit is not necessarily uh, 
liquid enough in case things do change? Well, first off, and this can also happen with credit cards. If the economy starts shaking, every time you pay down your credit card, the lower your credit limit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the banks are now starting to get scared. And home equity lines. <clears throat> People say, oh, yeah, I got a $200,000 worth of home equity line. Not a problem. My house is worth $700,000. I owe $500,000. In a recession, that house may only be worth $550,000. You do not have a $200,000 line of credit. Maybe you got $10,000. Maybe. Because right now, if it's worth 550 and you owe 500, that's 90% loan to value. They probably won't give you any credit. So people who think they've got this high amount of equity in equity lines and home, you know, home equity lines, when their equity drops because the value of the property drops, they no longer have that. Mm -hmm. If it's not in real cash somewhere in a stock market account into a money market account or some insurance policy that totally protects you against the recession. You don't have anything to buy when the prices go low. Well, you mm -hmm. have a dream because equity went away. It's that false sense of security. Yeah. And again, if I was doing it, I would be very careful what securities I put it in because the stock market is completely overbought. I mean, beyond anything anybody has ever seen. And people go, well, look at the stock market. It keeps going up. It keeps going up. And things are going, yeah, everything's going great. Uh, and then you go to the stock market analysts, because I'm not a stock market pro. I mean, I don't sit there and look. I, I, I went to the analysts and I said, <clears throat> okay, so what's wrong with the stock market? Look how great it is. He goes, no. There are five things holding the stock market up and growing. It's called FANG. Facebook, Facebook Apple, Amazon, Amazon, Apple. Netflix, and Google. Mm -hmm. Their stocks went straight up, and because they were so enormous, they hit trillion dollar valuations, it brought the entire market up. And then, if you look at all the rest of the market, most of those have not gone up in the last year or more, they've gone down. Yeah, you see was so companies strong. disappearing like Sears and uh, Toys R Us and used to be giants Bank. just 10 years ago, gone. They're, they're expecting close to 400 major retailers to disappear in the next two years. Oh. And people are more and more in trouble. And it's, it's getting really bad. We look at, you know, at student loan debt. Mm -hmm. in 1.6 trillion or something like that. People coming out of college, <clears throat> they've been sold a bill of goods. You won't get a job <clears throat> and pay back that enormous debt in most of the things that you graduate from. And unless you, even if you graduated with, as a doctor, now I've got quite a few medical doctors that I work with and most of them have quit their practice and turned their practice over to major universities like UCSD Medical Center or UCLA because they said they can no longer afford to keep their practice open because one, insurance companies don't pay, drug prices are too high, insurance is killing them, and they can't charge enough to make things work. So they ended up giving their practice to the university coming on as a professor, they now get paid a salary to run their own company. <laughs> it doesn't belong to them anymore. And this is huge in the industry. I mean, I've talked to a medical doctor after medical doctor who said, yeah, we're, we're part of UCSD Medical now. Yeah, I lost my, I lost my business. It's, it's not part of the university. And, I, you know, speaking of that, it, it's kind of funny how you see the state turn around and continue to implement the tax penalties for not having health insurance when the Fed, uh, you know, pulled out the penalties. It's, it's almost uh, the way you're describing it. I kind of get that sensation of let's try to force as many people to pay this thing to yeah. make things like that happen, to make things like that survive. But well, for my thing about healthcare, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I, people ask me, I says, if you saw the best healthcare program out there, what would it look like? I don't think you can find the best healthcare program out there and have it look like anything that you really look at. 
there are many you know, labor unions and big unions out there that have incredible health coverage for their employees. I wouldn't mess with that for anything. First of all, I'd probably get shot because somebody had a great <laughs> insurance policy and said, you're going to take it away from me? No way. <clears throat> I got the unions down my back. That wouldn't happen. And then you got the idiot like Bernie who says Medicare for all. Well, one of the reasons it would fail in a heartbeat, because <clears throat> there was many, many surveys that went out to hospitals and said, if all you had was Medicare to survive on, how long would you last? They said, we'd probably have to close our doors in about 90 days. The hospitals themselves? Yeah. Oh. And I said, why? Well, it's because Medicare doesn't pay anything. They don't pay the doctors anything. They don't pay us for anything. Uh, their numbers are so low, we can't survive on it. If we didn't have traditional insurance companies coming in and helping foot the bill, it'd be closed, gone. And there's a reason. And this reason happened a long time ago because Medicare <clears throat> was taken over by Congress. Medicare is not on its own. Medicare can make no decisions. Medicare cannot anyway negotiate drug prices. They can't do anything. I'm on Medicare. I'm 70, 71, actually, as of yesterday. Happy birthday. Thank you. And I had saw this ad on television and said, you can get a free back brace for no money through Medicare. Not a problem. And my back was a little sore. I'm like, okay, I'll get one of those. I get it in the mail. <clears throat> I looked at the, who made it? Looked at the model, the name, the manufacturer, and I went on the internet, the Amazon, all these places, and I found it in about a dozen places. And retail cost was about $75 for this back brace. In the back brace was an invoice that I had to sign and send to Medicare. The back brace price on it was $750. <laughs> 10 times. 10 times. I also got two knee braces. $1,500 for two knee braces that don't cost anywhere near that. So I called Medicare up. I says, hey, you know you're being ripped off? I says, I just saw this exact same make and model of this back brace for 150 bucks or $75 and they're charging you 750. I said, can you stop it? And he goes, no, we can't. I said, well, why? He says, Congress passed the law, says if they are an approved provider, we cannot negotiate their prices. It's ridiculous. They're charging you 10 times the retail price. He goes, yeah, I know. Nothing we can do about it. It's in the hand of Congress. And that's why Medicare has so much fraud in it. Because Medicare, in the hands of Congress, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to pull out the bad players. They don't know how to negotiate the right drug prices. They don't know how to do anything. And Medicare is in shambles. There's nothing but riddled with fraud bad pricing and a bad system. So why would you want to take the entire economy, everybody in there and put them into Medicare when it is absolutely a destroyed system? The first thing I would do is get Medicare out of the hands of Congress, put it into a panel who knows how to negotiate correctly and change everything so it becomes a self-sufficient real medical system care. One on a free market economy. Not just free market, they can, they can downplay the numbers, but when you're Medicare, you have an enormous amount of clout in negotiations. We have none right now because Congress took it away. Why won't Congress allow us to take it back? <clears throat> That's how they, they scratch each other's companies. back. The drug companies are paying a massive amounts of payroll and lobbying so that they can overcharge the public. I mean, if I was in charge, the first thing I would do is I would get rid of all the ads off the television, radio, magazines. The only kind of ad they can have in a magazine if it's in a medical magazine. Fine. Eliminate them. Because what we're seeing is the mind of the American public is being programmed as if they have something wrong. Oh, if you have any one of these 50 symptoms, you better tell your doctor you need this drug. No, you don't. The drugs don't work. It's almost been a proven fact that most of the drugs out there don't cure anything. 
Actually, they cause more trouble than they, than they cure. Exactly. I mean, we've had a cure for cancer for bookie years and it's been buried because the pharmaceutical industry said, nah. There's more money in the medicine. That's not about medicine. Treatment? It's a 50 to $100 billion research grant to all the universities and colleges that they subsidize so they can sell their medicines. Mm -hmm. If you take away and you said, I have a cure for cancer, which we have. All the universities that literally get grants for half a billion, billion dollars to do cancer research would go away because we wouldn't need them anymore. Speaking of going away, Paul, we got a few more minutes left. Ah. I want to ask you the last couple questions. Well, last uh, question here. Um, If people wanted to work with you, uh, learn a little bit more about what it is you're doing, um, maybe get a hold of your, the book that we talked about a little bit earlier, how do they get a hold of you? Okay. <clears throat> Probably the, uh, I have a lot of different emails, but the simplest one that I tell people that they, they, they seem to like is just call Paul at gmail.com. As soon as they know my name is Paul, just, J-U-S-T, call, C-A-L-L, Paul. Just call Paul at gmail.com is where I get all my inquiries coming in, or they can call me on my phone. 760-726-4228. And that's my private cell phone. I take calls because I want to be able to help people the best way I can. And primarily what I am doing now is I've kind of shifted out of real estate a little bit, even though I do it, and I'm still a licensed broker for life. I am going back in and, I'm, and I've reopened my debt s- settlement or debt relief company. And this is where I help people get out of credit card debt. Student loan debt, that's a tough one. But I could do trade payables. I could do judgments. I could do almost anything. If you've gotten into problems and you got debts out there, I can help probably resolve them at a much lower number. The difference is between me and everybody else is one, I don't charge an upfront fee for anything. Not administration, nothing. You call me up, you say I have a problem, I'll talk to you. If it makes sense, I send you a contract. It's like a couple pages long in like 18 point type. I mean, <laughs> why? Because I can't see real well. So I use big print. I let everybody look at big print. <laughs> but, but it is real clear. It says, I am a performance-based company. You owe me nothing per month. There are no monthly payments. You owe me nothing for the consultation or any of the work that I work with you on that. But if I do a settlement for you and I am not allowed to do a settlement without your written approval of the settlement. All I can do is, pardon me, verbally talk to them. You owe me nothing. If I get you no savings, you owe me nothing. It's my waste of time. And that's all there is to it. But you will learn a lot from me in credit and debt systems. But if I do settle your debt, as opposed to a lot of these other big companies, which I think is the second largest one just got sued by the federal government and they lost 20 million to the feds and they have to pay all of their subscribers money because they took money on monthly payments and never did anything for them. Mm. The people stopped making the monthly payments. They said, Oh, you avoided your contract. We're keeping the money, which was in completely illegal. But the government almost shut these guys down and they do like 50,000 deals a month. I mean, they had enormous ripoffs of the general public, but I see, I can't do that because one, I don't touch your money. I don't take any monthly payments. No money is in my name. And when I get the settlement, I give it to you and I get a percentage of the savings I got for you, which is 25%. So my incentive is to get you the absolute best deal in town. My last one that I did for a really good client, and these were fairly well-off people, but I structured it so it didn't look like they were fairly well-off. And I took their $178,000 worth of credit card debt. And by the time I was done, including my fee, I saved them $100,000. That's not an unusual thing for big dollars if, if you structure it right with the, and I was dealing with attorneys and collection people who aren't necessarily the best people to work with, but because I know my job so well, I know how to gain rapport from them 
and get them to say the right words to their client to take the deal. I mean, I've been, I've been doing literally contracts, negotiations in credit, in, in real estate, in mortgage lending, because I was a mortgage broker for 25 years. And I was a debt settlement agent, the top one in the company for many years. I know how to deal with these people. And yes, you could do the same thing I could do. Probably not quite as well, but yes, you could. If you knew all the rules and regulations, you knew how to gain rapport with them, you knew what to say, yeah, you could do the same thing I did. Anybody can. So Paul, let them know one more time your telephone number so you can help save people some money. 760-726-4228. I am in California Pacific time in San Diego County. So if anybody's in the area, I love working with California people. Debt settlement based on federal and state law is not legal in every state. There's some states that unless you're a nonprofit and you attempt to help somebody, even if you're not collecting a fee, they can put you in jail. So there are some states out there. So if you call me, I will have to verify that I can actually work with you in, within your state before I can do anything. <clears throat> And again, it's very, very simple. I, you know, I really interview to find out where your head's at. And the other thing too is because I do not take payments and I don't ask anybody to take payments, part of the ability to settle is to have a check in full for the amount of the settlement and me. So, and that's what happens when I set, because typically not all credit cards are settled at the same time. So if you had five credit cards, there's going to be five different settlements at different times. It's just- But you got to make sure that whoever you're dealing with has a substantial right. liquidity to be able to handle that. Right. So if I, if I did a $10,000 credit card, and so let's just say I knocked five grand it away, okay? You would still have to come up with the five grand for the company, and you'd have to come up with about $1,250 for me. So that's about 6,250. You have to have readily available because typically they will give you anywhere from three to 10 days to pay it. There are rare occasions in which they will give you three payments, the one that's due that day, and they almost want it within 24 hours, then in 30 days, and the last payment in 60 days from the time we make the settlement. You will see it all in writing, and you'll see it from the creditor to you with all the terms and conditions, because it's not between me and you. You and the debtor or the creditor are the ones that finalize the agreements and you pay them directly, not me. That way you have a canceled check, you've got all the documents and you know for sure it's gotten rid of. And, and that's how you do it. And that then there's a trick in how you do it. And it's also on occasions, now this is not a, a for sure thing. Some collection agencies and some attorneys will actually remove the derogatory from your line item on your credit report <clears throat> by doing one of two things. They can either just remove the entire line item as if you weren't even, you ever borrowed money from it. It's just gone. That's a good thing. The second thing is they could also put down paid in full per agreement. Because the new agreement you have was for $5,000. You paid them that, so they put down paid as per agreement. But in your history, it still shows late payments. So it's not the best thing, but it is better than them saying paid for less than the full amount. Correct. Where the negotiations really needs to be done correctly to get them to agree to that. Well, Paul, thank you very much for taking the time to get to, to be on the show. I, uh, I really enjoyed getting to know you. I, I learned a ton from, uh, from history to current events. So thank you very much for being on the show. Oh, one other thing about me. In my local area in San Diego, I am known as the Jewish Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> this time of year, I do things for the Marine Corps, for the kids, and I also go to the homeless shelters and things, and I'll be collecting toys and being a real Santa Claus. So, uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Still a little early for that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold you to it, but uh, again, thank you for being on the show, Paul. Ladies and gents, 
if there's anybody I can help, the call is free. Just call Paul. That's it. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. You have a wonderful evening. Absolutely. And you guys too.